It's a crisp spring morning in Manhattan. A perfect day for a march down Broadway. But on this day, for this crowd, the Big Apple isn't exactly rolling out the red carpet. There are delays and confusion about where to gather. Mayor Rudy Giuliani waits until the very last minute to issue the necessary permit. But several thousand show up anyway, and eventually this ragtag army begins the long trek to Battery Park. The marchers have all come together this day for various reasons, but with one common voice, to protest the United States policies on marijuana. The marchers are cordially escorted by a phalanx of New York's finest. Or so it seems. Business as usual in America's war on drugs. They're not going to get rid of us that easy. For the last 30 years, a hardcore band of activists has been fighting the war on marijuana in what they see as a struggle for truth and justice. One man among them stands apart. He has been described as a cult folk hero, a boisterous rabble rouser, a crazy man. His name is often mispronounced. He likes to say it rhymes with terror. But one thing is certain. Because of him, we enter the next millennium with a new knowledge of an ancient plant. A plant whose present-day revival was sparked by this man's 1985 best-selling book. The book revealed the lost history of the hemp plant, and in doing so, lit a fire under a legion of followers the world over. Its title is, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. Its author is known as the father of today's burgeoning hemp movement. His name is Jack Herrer. At 60 years of age, Jack Herrer has been stumping for hemp nearly half his life. It's been a long, strange, and decidedly uphill journey. But he trudges onward despite ill health somehow turning on the passion when the curtain goes up. Things outlawed the natural, and I say we've got to take it back by standing together. Make a legal million man. Make a legal million man march next year. Make it two million. Come to New York next year. Mayday. There was a time, not too many years ago, that Jack Herrer's ideas about hemp were deemed irrational, extreme, off the wall. But today, those harsh judgments seem like a distant memory. Jack Herrer's great genius was in introducing a broader vision of the economic value of the hemp plant. I didn't know anything about hemp or the fact that there was a movement until Jack sat me down one night he is what you might call a force of nature. I've met several people in my lifetime who I would judge as having such fiery intensity within them that approve of them or disapprove of them, you have to acknowledge that they are forces of nature. I saw Jack as a Michigan, a crazy man. And um, particularly when it came to this whole idea that hemp was going to somehow re revolutionize the world and revolutionize the marijuana reform movement. And so, uh, Michigan is the right word for Jack.
Jack Herrer was an unlikely candidate for emperor of hemp. He was born into a conservative, middle-class Jewish family in 1939 and grew up in Buffalo, New York. He led a normal, happy life there until his 41-year-old father died of a heart attack when Jack was only 14. Within a span of three years, Jack went from Boy Scout to high school dropout. To avoid a two-week jail term for driving after dark with a junior license, 17-year-old Jack Herrer enlisted in the Army. He quickly adapted to military life. The gung-ho soldier served honorably as an MP in post-war Korea. By the mid-60s, Jack was out of the Army and back into a normal middle-class lifestyle. Wife, three small children, a ranch house in the San Fernando Valley in California, and a series of routine managerial jobs. Army duty had made him proud of his country. He was a Goldwater Republican. He believed in old-fashioned American values, and he supported the country's growing involvement in Vietnam. Well, I had done three years in the military. I believed I was right on guy. I believed America was always the good guy. It was, they, I mean, always the most decent, right on people on the earth. The 60s upheavals offended Jack. He especially had a very low regard for the anti-war protesters. I thought that they were the most un-American kids in the world. And what evil spell had turned previously well-behaved, well-dressed, middle-class white kids into loathsome, rebellious hippies? To Jack and the establishment, marijuana must have had something to do with it. From the time marijuana first showed up in police blotters and newspaper headlines in the early years of the century, its use had been limited primarily to Mexican immigrants and black jazz musicians. Marijuana was hardly noticed at all until it was discovered by the white middle class in the 60s when millions of baby boomers actually inhaled. Coincidence or not, they began burning American flags, ROTC buildings, and draft cards. Even future leaders of the free world tried marijuana back then. Jack hated marijuana for its association with the counterculture. But he also had deep-rooted personal fears deriving from the reefer madness propaganda of his youth. In the schools, they'd have this guy in a dark fedora hat, and uh, he, he, he looked like um, Vincent Price, as shady as he could be, and he would be um, going, Psh. You try one of these for free, kid, you know? And then all sorts of devil things. Next thing you were shooting heroin, you know, you were um, doing cocaine. You were doing things in exotic named drugs that I had no experience with. And I was sure that this was going to happen to me. The 60s rising tide of social change eventually swept in and altered the course of Jack's life. In 1967, he and his wife divorced. One day, a couple of years later, a new girlfriend asked him a question. Uh, she said, Jack, have you ever smoked marijuana? I said, of course not, no. I've never smoked marijuana. She said, well, I think you should.
I was feeling sensations that I didn't even know a human being could experience. And I said, why is this illegal? She said, she doesn't know. I began to hear the protesters about the war in Vietnam, and their words had real meanings, textures. They weren't just talking about, I don't want to fight because I'm a coward, which is the way I thought of it in my, my ignorant or brutish way before. Peace and freedom became big issues for Jack. So did the environment. But as the 70s began, the journey of Jack Herrer from Goldwater Republican to Emperor of Hemp was only just beginning. Jack's transformation gained some momentum in 1973 when he satisfied a lifelong urge to write. He and a friend co-authored a little cartoon book about marijuana titled simply, Grass. Much to his surprise, Grass became an underground hit, selling about 35,000 copies. Almost overnight, Jack gained a reputation as an authority on marijuana. And now everybody thought I knew all about pot. I knew every little subtle thing. And I still didn't even know if I ran across a marijuana plant growing in a field, I wouldn't even recognize it. Like millions of other Americans back then, Jack knew nothing of marijuana's history and had no idea that marijuana was actually hemp, the non-intoxicating but still very much illegal variety of the ancient cannabis sativa plant. But as sales of his little grass book raised his profile, strangers began to come up to him with intriguing bits of information. They come up to me and say, Mr. Herr, do you know that they used to make paper from marijuana. Some other kid would come up to me and says, do you know that they used to make all their sales and clothes out of marijuana? The idea that it had other uses, that you could make paper out of it, that you could make cloth out of it, you could make cord out of it, you could make oil, you could make medicine. Those I had never occurred to Jack, and boy, did he take that idea and run with it. Jack was amazed to discover hemp's deep connection to mankind. For over 10,000 years, hemp was undeniably our most useful plant. Our ancestors depended on hemp's exceptionally strong fiber, cellulose-rich pulp, and highly nutritious seeds. The plant was cultivated and used throughout history for food, clothing, fuel, and medicine, as well as for sails, rope, shelter, and paper. In colonial America, hemp was not only legal, but essential to survival. Uh, Washington planted hemp at Mount Vernon in the 1790s um, while he was president in an attempt to start a home industry so that the United States would not have to depend on Italy and on Russia and on England for their hemp fiber. Um, this was just after the revolution, and the United States was trying madly not to have to rely on foreign countries for any products. Armed with this new knowledge, Jack set out to persuade the marijuana reform movement to join him aboard his new hemp bandwagon. But to his surprise, nobody got on, not even the usual suspects. Many of us thought that Jack was uh, perhaps uh, too focused only on hemp. Uh, most of us were only focused on let's stop arresting smokers and we sort of thought the hemp issue was a secondary issue and maybe not as important. And we weren't even sure there was a constituency out there that cared about it. The message, as well as the messenger, turned people off. When he first talked about hemp, to me in particular, I was very resistant because I thought of it as being just a 
excuse to, mar to legalize marijuana. He tended in his enthusiasm to overstate the case a bit. And in so doing, uh, sometimes the rest of us were embarrassed by that. We felt like it might undermine all of our credibility. He would go on and rant about, you know, hemp and how it was important and how it could, how he found this and found that. And I paid little or no attention to him because he has a tendency to rant and rave about a lot of things, if you know him. I suspect I'm probably one of those people that refused to return Jack's phone calls. Go! There was one person who did accept Jack's ideas back then. An easygoing marijuana activist named Ed Adair could see the sense to what Jack was saying. Adair, known to everyone as Captain Ed, owned two popular Los Angeles head shops. I'd heard he'd sold 12 of the uh, grass books. So I went over there and introduced myself, and he looked at me and he says, I've been selling the hell out of these books. And he says, are you sure you're okay you smoke pot? Because what I walked in with was a white plastic jacket with my uh, polyester pants. I'm a California man. Jack followed Captain Ed's example and traded his polyester suits for jeans and t-shirts. The two became inseparable friends, and over the years, they collected hundreds of thousands of signatures for various legalization initiatives in California. When Captain Ed and I made a pledge, it was to work every day to legalize cannabis until we were dead, it was legal, or we turned 84. And we always felt the great injustice is that if anybody was in jail for cannabis for any reasons, it would always be too big of an injustice to walk away from and not spend almost all our time trying to change. One night in 1974, Jack experienced what he describes as nothing short of a revelation. All his newfound knowledge of the hemp plant suddenly coalesced into a single powerful vision. Hemp could actually save the world. In a flash moment it came to him that virtually everything now made from trees and petroleum could instead be made from hemp. That not another single tree would ever have to be cut down to make paper. That clean burning fuel would now be made from the biomass of the abundant hemp plant. This new fuel would run cars, factories, power plants, and would even provide heat for our homes. That hemp could be grown and processed into cloth and paper with only a fraction of the toxic chemicals used in processing cotton and trees. Jack pictured a world saved from pollution, acid rain, global warming, and deforestation. Well, just about everybody assumed that Jack had gone completely mad. And my own kids thought, Dad, you've gone overboard. I mean, you're, you're doing this marijuana legalization now for three years, and now you've gone overboard. Normal felt the same way. You could tell people that, that marijuana is going to save the world. No self-respecting person will come to the marijuana movement. They'll think they're going to involved with a nut like you. All the world, all of a sudden, is it a Thick-skinned and unrelenting, Jack ignored the naysayers and stuck to his guns. Late in 1979, he and Captain Ed opened the nation's first hemp store, an outdoor stand famous to this day, where else but Venice Beach, California. Overnight, Jack became a boardwalk fixture, the hemp merchant of Venice, a man of hemp and cloth, preaching the gospel. He's interested in saving the damned world and informing everyone he knows about hemp. He wears it on his body. He can't stop to buy a hot dog without starting to spread the news. He's been doing this continually. 
Now, when a guy like this is more like an Armenian rug merchant on the Lower East Side or something. You know what I mean? He's, he's straight off the Bowery. He, he's a working class guy. As the 80s began and the country braced itself for an official policy of zero tolerance toward marijuana, Jack was about to have a close encounter with the 40th president of the United States. January 1981, West Los Angeles, California. Mere days before the presidential inauguration, Jack and a small encampment of followers are campaigning for California hemp and marijuana initiatives. Along comes Ronald Reagan. President-elect Reagan's motorcade pulls up to the federal building. He's scheduled for a pre-inaugural haircut. According to eyewitnesses, the great communicator questions the building manager. By the way, he says, what are the Canadians protesting about out there? And uh, he thought that the marijuana flag we were flying out there was the maple leaf. <laughs> and, he, and, and the guy that's the manager of the office of the building, he says, well, he's, they're, they're, not, they're not Canadians. Those are marijuana protesters. And Reagan says, well, isn't there something you can do about that? Well, we've taken the court and they've won. Well, I'll be on duty in five days. I'll see what I can do for you. What Reagan does is have Jack and five others arrested for violating an arcane wartime sabotage act. The others pay a $5 fine and get probation. Jack fights. He refuses to pay the fine and loses. His appeal is unsuccessful. The United States Supreme Court refuses to hear the case. So on July 14th, 1983, Jack reports to federal prison at Terminal Island, California. There was a lot of bank robbers in federal prison in 1983. And um, there I was, what are you in here for? Um, I was registering voters after dark. <laughs> on federal property. <laughs> they put you in jail. <laughs> Running for the border, spinning to the light, frozen night on wonder, and a holy terror inside. I smell the river. Jack's incarceration would have been insignificant, except for the fact that he finally had the time and solitude to begin writing another book. There was no radio, there was no television, no movies, no nothing to distract me. A couple guys would sing gospel songs a, a cappella, but that was, that was about it. I knew that Jack Herrera's book was gonna become an underground classic. I knew it right away from the first time I saw the first edition. People opened that book and said, you can make food out of hemp seed oil, you can burn it in a lamp, you can make rope, uh, you can make parachute cordage and tie your shoes. And the Constitution was really printed on hemp paper. I mean, people love that. In 1985, Jack published The Emperor Wears No Clothes. Since then, the book has gone on to become an underground phenomenon, selling more than 600,000 copies worldwide and is now in its 11th edition. The first populist book of its kind, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, is part scientific document, part journalistic expose, and part holy crusade. It takes us on a journey of discovery that provides a caustic, sarcastic, and often irreverent look at the forgotten history and economic potential of the hemp plant. Written in simple and scholarly detail, its pages are filled with numerous articles, historical documents, photographs, and diagrams, along with the writings of poets, philosophers, and, of course, the emperor himself. 
we learn of the thousands of commercial and therapeutic uses of hemp, and how hemp has been a significant part of our spiritual and cultural heritage throughout the ages. We discover how the hemp seed could again become a basic world food, and how no other single plant seed contains virtually all the nutritional elements necessary to maintain healthy human life. The Emperor Wears No Clothes explores in great detail Jack's most passionate beliefs that biomass fuels derived from hemp can provide virtually all of the world's energy needs, eliminating the global dependence on our nearly depleted fossil fuels. That the systematic destruction of our environment can be dramatically reduced or even stopped by using hemp as the resource for fiber, fuel, and paper. The book makes the case for hemp as the world's savior, and Jack backs it up with a $50,000 offer to anyone who can prove him wrong. So far, he's had no takers. The book also takes us on a journey of the bizarre, the curious origin of marijuana prohibition. Only in the 20th century did the ancient hemp plant become a frightening new drug. The Mexican slang word, marijuana, was unknown to most Americans until it began appearing in newspaper headlines early in the century. Marijuana horror stories, works of pure fiction, were staples of the sensationalistic newspapers owned by William Randolph Hearst. But even respectable papers printed outrageous tales. Although this story would be relegated to the tabloids today, it was fit to print in the distinguished New York Times on July 6, 1927. A Mexican woman and her four children are driven insane by marijuana, the New York Times reported. It went on to say that neighbors rushed to the house to find the entire family insane. <laughs> it is convinced that he is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. It is recommended, Your Honor, that the defendant be placed at an institution for the criminally insane for the rest of his natural life. The next tragedy may be that of your daughter, or your son, or your or yours, or yours. When driving down the road and the sheriff smells your load, you better make it to woods if you can. Although alcohol prohibition required a constitutional amendment, marijuana prohibition was brought about by a single federal law, the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. The driving force behind this law was Harry J. Anslinger, America's first drug czar. Anslinger was the government's expert witness during 1937 congressional hearings on the proposed Marijuana Tax Act. As proof of marijuana's malevolence, Anslinger introduced into evidence the bogus Hearst newspaper headlines that trumpeted the Violence, insanity, and death, allegedly caused by marijuana. In 1937, when the Marijuana Tax Act uh, was established, there were no data of any sort, much less scientific, about whether this compound was harmful or not. There was just evidence it was being used by people uh, whom we distrusted and feared, and that it was associated with lower class people. You go back and read the record in Congress, it's amazing the lack of information. There were literally questions by members of Congress saying, what is this marijuana? Is it a narcotic or what is it? And there would be a sentence, uh, some, someone would stand up and say, oh, it's the most dangerous new drug coming down the pipe. In terms of what Congress knew in 1937, they didn't know any of that history. The only history that they were given was all these cock and bull stories about how it made people crazy and they went out and killed people under the influence of marijuana. The Tax Act was built on lies and I think it's outrageous that we have legislation that still exists today 
uh, that, that the, it was based on lies. Despite opposition by the American Medical Association, Congress passed the law unanimously after debating for a grand total of 90 seconds. President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed it into law on August 3, 1937. Theoretically, the new law did not actually prohibit marijuana and hemp. Only a constitutional amendment could do that. But by imposing prohibitive taxes and mountains of red tape, it made cultivation, processing, sales, and any use of the hemp plant whatsoever virtually impossible. Technically, farmers could still legally grow a hemp plant like this one, but only if they could somehow grow it without the leaves and flowers. This law is still in effect today. The full reasons behind marijuana prohibition are still being debated. Some experts think racism played a part. So that when poor people, immigrants, take the drugs, we're afraid they're going to rise up, smite, steal, and take the white women. And so we outlaw the drugs because of our fears over that. Others think Harry Anslinger was motivated by ambition and power. A great deal of the reason that marijuana was prohibited was because of self-aggrandizement at the federal level, especially with Harry Anslinger wanting to be the J. Edgar Hoover of his own agency. Jack sees darker motives. His book alleges a high-level conspiracy revolving around Anslinger, Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon, the DuPont Chemical Company, and hemp. Before the Civil War, hemp was the nation's second largest cash crop behind cotton. But while cotton could be processed by machine, slaves were the only cost-effective way to separate the tough hemp fiber from the pulpy core that was used to make paper. When slavery ended after the war, the hemp industry went into decline. The death knell was sounded in the late 1800s when papermakers converted to tree-based pulp. It meant that uh, you could chop down a forest a lot cheaper than you could pay laborers to manufacture hemp fiber for paper. Jack hangs his conspiracy angle on events that happened simultaneously with marijuana prohibition. Coincidence number one. A German immigrant invented a machine called the decorticator. This new mechanical processing device was about to bring hemp into the modern industrial age. Popular Mechanics magazine recognized the potential bonanza for American farmers and entrepreneurs. This article heralded a machine that could process hemp quickly and cheaply for the first time in history. Coincidence number two. The DuPont Company in the 30s came out with both a sulfuric acid method for making paper from trees and a new invention called plastic. Jack's book points out that a hemp resurgence would certainly have been a serious threat to DuPont's petrochemical strategies. And finally, there's millionaire financier Andrew Mellon. Mellon was Anslinger's boss, Harry's wife's uncle, and DuPont's banker. Coincidences number three, four, and five. Don't smoke out of my grass. The book's credibility got a boost from Jack's discovery of this 14-minute documentary. Supposedly made by the U.S. government five years after the Marijuana Tax Act. Its purpose was to encourage farmers to grow outlawed hemp during World War II. Long ago, when these ancient Grecian temples were new, hemp was already old in the service of mankind. For thousands of years, even then, this plant had been grown for cordage and coarse cloth in China and elsewhere in the East. 
But now, with Philippine and East Indian sources of hemp in the hands of the Japanese, and shipment of jute from India curtailed, American hemp must meet the needs of our army and navy, as well as of our industries. In 1942, patriotic farmers at the government's request planted 36,000 acres of seed hemp, an increase of several thousand percent. The goal for 1943 is 50,000 acres of seed hemp. For to grow hemp legally, you must have a federal registration and tax stamp. This is provided for in your contract. Ask your AAA committee man or your county agent about it. Don't forget. Jack often staged public showings of hemp for victory to validate his history of the plant. He also used the film as an example of government deception and hypocrisy. But he was stunned one day in 1988 to get a call from a newspaper reporter questioning the authenticity of the film. Well, Mr. Hare, we went out to check the information and um, we found nobody that would corroborate your story that um, this movie was even ever made. Uh, you said this movie was made by the United States government, this movie Hemp for Victory. That if there would be any evidence that the government ever made such a film, it would be in the Library of Congress, it would be in the Department of Agriculture, it is in neither place. His reputation on the line, Jack and his friends went on an excursion to Washington, D.C. We were just determined to find the documentation that made it a credible uh, government movie made by the U.S. government and not made by Jack. We didn't see it as detective work. We just saw it as we were on a mission. We're on a mission from God. <laughs> Many others before Jack had searched the Library of Congress for proof of the documentary's existence and found none. In a day of digging, Jack ran into the same lack of evidence. After deciding to give up, we decided to give it one more try. In a dusty old book, hidden among clutter in a back room, they found it, the official Library of Congress documentation. Indeed, the film had been made by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Hemp for victory. In the few short years since The Emperor Wears No Clothes first began inspiring activists and entrepreneurs, the U.S. hemp industry has grown from Jack's ramshackle Venice Beach booth into a hundred million dollar a year business. I was shopping for a suit the other day and walked into the department store. Stepped on the elevator and told the girl, dry goods flow. When I got off, a salesman come up to me. He said, now, what can I do for you? I said, well, go in there and show me all the sport clothes like you supposed to. He said, well, show. Come on in, buddy, and dig these fabrics we got laid out on the shelf. He said, pick yourself out one. Try it on. Stand in the mirror and dig yourself. The world's getting this information. It's coming out on billboards. It's coming out on companies all over, everywhere. As hemp gained mainstream acceptance in the 90s, so did Jack. His critics became allies. When Steve Hager became editor of High Times in the late 80s, and he went ahead and just wrote column after column, uh, article after article, month after month in his magazine. And that's really what exploded the idea of hemp, more to the colleges, more to everybody that picked up a High Times now read about hemp. In 1994, he was honored by the Conservative Drug Policy Foundation in Washington. With his efforts for showing the impact one individual can have on the lives of many others, Jack Herra is awarded the 1994 Robert C. Randall Award for achievement in the field of citizen action. At the awards dinner, the emperor wore a hemp suit. But 
nothing vindicated Jack more than a 1992 Lifetime Achievement Award from his longtime adversary, Normal. How do I call myself at times like these? I need a simple kind of lovely and the thought is just a novelty. From a nemesis to a prophet, I think, is the way to look at it. He was a bother and a troublesome until he began to realize he had really discovered a very important aspect of why it is that marijuana should be reconsidered and why it should, the illegality of it is so preposterous and unfair. I think that Jack's place in the history of anti-prohibition movement is going to be secured by the simple fact that he, despite everybody's criticisms, everybody thinking he was crazy, that he had the persistence and the temerity to simply keep going on and saying the truth over and over and over again, no matter, it, it sometimes seems like you have to say the truth many times before anybody hears it. The Emperor Wears No Clothes is a book that's had an enormous impact in this country on awakening millions of Americans to the fact that the marijuana laws are wrong, that they're based on false premises, uh, that they're racial in nature, and that we need to change them. I don't know anyone who's had as much impact as Jack has. Neither Jack nor anyone else in the outgunned, outspent reform movement was having any impact at all on U.S. drug policies. In the last years of the 20th century, incredibly, America was the only industrialized nation that still forbid hemp farming, forcing the U.S. hemp industry to import all its raw material. According to the government, allowing farmers to grow hemp would confuse police and send a wrong message to children. Drugs are every nation's problem, and every nation must act to fight them. We are determined to build the drug-free America and to join with others to combat drugs around the world. Let there be no doubt, this is ultimately a struggle for human freedom. In the 90s, the federal government escalated the war on marijuana, spending a record amount of money to arrest a record number of Americans, most for simple possession. Since prohibition began in 1937, upwards of 70 million Americans have tried marijuana at least once. A staggering 11 million of them have been arrested with one in every 40 prisoners a marijuana offender. The United States has become the world's biggest jailer. Some states now spend more on prisons than on higher education. Even alcohol prohibition did not punish the users of alcohol. Uh, when marijuana prohibition was instituted, however, it, the prohibition was aimed directly at users, which it had not been with alcohol prohibition. Well, just here in America, it's 14 million years have been spent on prison, jails, parole, or probation since the 1930s for marijuana. 14 million years. I can't even begin to calculate what that is at $25,000, $30,000 a year now. It gets me angry every day. All available research has concluded that marijuana is dangerous to our health. Marijuana limits learning and memory perception and judgment and our ability to drive a car. The war on marijuana is also a war on the sick and dying. Even after California and five other states overwhelmingly approved medical marijuana initiatives in the late 90s, the federal government still plays hardball. Despite these initiatives, we want to make clear that federal law still applies, and federal officials will continue to apply the law, and DEA officials will review cases, as they have, 
to determine whether to revoke the registration of any physician who recommends or prescribes so-called Schedule I controlled substances. This is not a medical initiative. This is a legalization of drugs issue. The federal government, by classifying marijuana in Schedule I, is saying that it has no medical uses, which is a bald-faced lie because it has 10,000 years in every culture of medical use. United States policy to the contrary, cannabis has long been esteemed as a safe, effective, and non-addicting medicine. For thousands of years, it was prescribed by the greatest physicians of their day. It was used for dozens of conditions, ranging from migraines, chronic pain, and asthma, to childbirth, muscle spasms, and even depression. Today, it also provides relief for victims of multiple sclerosis, glaucoma, the AIDS wasting syndrome, and nausea induced by chemotherapy. It's impossible for a human to overdose and die, which is not true of alcohol, nicotine, barbiturates, or morphine. Um, and so it's a drug which humans can use under a wide variety of circumstances with safety. Even so, U.S. House Republicans, using language that would have made Harry Anslinger proud, passed a resolution in 1998 branding marijuana a dangerous, addictive drug with no medical use. marijuana is the only drug that can alleviate your pain and suffering so that you can live longer, so that you can take your chemotherapy, so that you have a, a reasonable quality of life. They would rather fight the war on drugs even though they know that there are sick and dying patients being denied relief because of their position. Unconscionable. Well, you would think that after at least a generation of, of really good information about marijuana being circulated. Why is the war still going on? One, I think the people in charge of government today, particularly in the law enforcement sections of government, are people who are afraid of the, of the culture around marijuana. Uh, it, it harkens back to the Vietnam War era, Vietnam War protests, the civil rights protests, people who are trying to change the government. But notwithstanding that people talk about how the police are not particularly interested in marijuana cases, in fact, it is their bread and butter. The war on drugs is supported in part now because we have a drug abuse establishment. Every place I turn and talk to somebody about what he or she does, he's in drug abuse treatment, drug abuse prevention, drug abuse education, uh, uh, urine testing, uh, interdiction. Uh, he's a policeman, an undercover investigator, uh, a jail builder, a jail keeper. Uh, I sometimes think there's nobody left in the United States except a few of us and all the people who are making their living fighting the war on drugs. They used to call us the land of the free, and now they call us the land of the pee, where you have to pee to be te and tested to be free. What a crock. All you have to do is say the word drugs, and you can change the Constitution so that it's meaningless. You can search people's homes without valid cause. You can seize people's property without valid cause. You can seize people's lives and destroy families. They talk about family values. How many thousands of families have been destroyed by these vicious laws? Not another medicine, not another drug on this planet that nobody has ever died from. Nobody has ever died from marijuana that wasn't shot by a cop. Jack Herrera. Have I pronounced it correctly, Jack? Herrera. Herrera. Uh, Herrera. Okay. Jack Herrera. Jack Herrera. Jack Herrera. Jack Herrera. This to Jack Herrera. We're going to put on Jack Herrera. Hemp. Cult acclaim has not made Jack a household name nor does he live like an emperor. Most of his income from book sales 
goes to finance his causes, not his lifestyle. Hemp. When he's not on the road for weeks at a time campaigning for hemp and medical marijuana, Jack lives and works in this small, cramped apartment in Van Nuys, California. There he is, singer. Jack is a cultural icon. He is probably as well known as anyone who's ever had, a, had an opinion uh, to offer on this subject. He is better known than probably anyone else who works on the marijuana law reform issue. Um, he is a, uh, a phenomenon that's been very positive. Uneasy rests the crown on he who would save the world. Jack enters the new millennium, still grieving over the untimely death of Captain Ed Adair, taken by leukemia in 1991 at the age of 51. We have been together 19 years, the greatest friend a guy could ever have. He worked so hard to save this planet, and he believed he was saving it for you, me, his children, and he thought that this was the way to do it. Captain Ed and I planned was to get out and teach this information. Eventually we would get a cadre of believers and eventually they would go out and teach the world. And now we know that we've succeeded. And now we understand so much about the man. He's not insane, he is not crazy. He's not the devil in disguise. So listen closely to the winds of change and see the world. Despite some health problems, Jack has no plans to kick back and take it easy with longtime companion Jeannie Hawkins. With the publishing of the 11th edition of The Emperor Wears No Clothes in late 1998, Jack's schedule is more hectic than ever, taking him and his message around the world. Jack is haunted, however, by the hard, cold facts of prohibition. Despite its undeniable potential as the natural, renewable alternative to a synthetic world, the hemp plant, by federal law, still cannot be cultivated in the United States. Despite increasing public and scientific support, the medical use of marijuana still remains illegal. And despite the enormous cost in money and human lives, millions of people are still being arrested for possessing a therapeutic substance revered by our ancestors. This is the reality of America's war on a plant, a war born of commerce and greed, an endless war. And so the fight goes on and on. I don't know if hemp's gonna save the world, but I'll tell you this. Is the only thing that can. A true love story is hard to find. Can't get no rest, got no peace of mind. You say you gave your heart to me. You put me. This is a model of the USS Constitution, what we call Old Ironsides, which became famous during the War of 1812. Conestoga wagons and the wagons that went west were covered with hempen canvas. The Constitution had 60 tons of hemp on it. The sails, the ropes, the flags, the books, the Bibles, the maps. The word canvas is just the Dutch pronunciation 
of cannabis. The sealant between the loose and green beams was all oakum made from hemp. Canvas sails were cannabis sails. Canvas covered wagons were cannabis covered wagons. Eleven acres of farms had to be growing in constant production every year for nothing else than the hemp. It took 3,600 man hours to make the sails and the ropes for this ship each year. And they went along, and all the oil on the wheels, all the oil on the wheels was always made with hemp seed oil because they didn't have any petroleum oil. And they never had a better oil than, than uh, hemp seed oil. And, and I, I just thought I'd be a wise guy a little bit, but a nice wise guy, and I said, um, you know what those sails were made of? And he says, nylon. I said, no, no, no. I said, I said no, no, I mean, not, not 20 years ago, 10 years ago. I'm talking about 1812. What were the sails made of? He said, nylon. Deep in the valleys of California, to the farms of Oregon, from the mountains of North Carolina, to the shores of Maine, and finally, to the President in Washington, D.C. The hemp industry has gone from prohibition to prosperity, from the root to the meat of the herb, from bags of cash to e-wallets full of crypto, from recreational to medicinal, from genesis to revelation, this is Crypto Weed. So what we do, we take in uh, hemp that is grown and dried by farmers and we process process that into CBD oil through extraction. To make a solution. Too much frustration. So much confusion. Yeah. I don't wanna live in the park. Through fires, floods, and freezing weather, we will always stand with the American farmers. An exciting new documentary film series unveiling the $200 billion hemp and cannabis industry and how blockchain decentralization replaces the fiat banking industry cabal of the past. Streaming worldwide this Christmas. Roll with us at gettheherb.com. This film is in memory of our mentor, Jack Herrer. Please help support our film sponsor. 
Green Herb Botanical Infusions, 100% naturally and organically grown, and American Farm CBD oils, herbs and products made in the USA. Learn more at getgreenherb.com.